the commercialization of Christianity has done nothing for the furtherance of biblical truth. I'll say that again. The commercialization of Christianity has done nothing for the furtherance of biblical truth. New believers, and I would include my wife and I in this too, um, we have in our former Christian infancy become caught up in the celebrity and slick marketing of mainstream charismatic ministry. The anointed man or woman of God, well-dressed and perhaps well-intentioned even, preaches into the camera or down to the masses a message that is half-truth and half-tyranny, a message that never comes for free and for which monetary return is expected and a given. There are good teachers out there. Yes, there are. <sighs> but you know what, beloved? In the Christian marketplace, uh, too often we're motivated by money. That's 1 Timothy 6, 9-10. So it's buyer beware, and we must ask God for supernatural discernment in these days. It says in 1 John 4, 1, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Wow, we know that for sure. We know that for sure. And it says in 1 John 4, 6, We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Let God be true. Let every man be a liar. Only God is true. Only Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I feel this, this Christian marketplace may cause you to feel that this is the main stage on which the amazing and miraculous moves of God take place. You know what? The Bible teaches otherwise. <laughs> Beloved, God calls the invisible. God calls the humble. God calls the broken. God calls the surrendered. God calls the unable. Why? So that we learn to depend on him alone. So that he receives all the glory. Psalm 115.1 says, Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.27, to 129, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify, nullify the things that are so that no one, no one may boast before him. In Acts 9, God actually had to demolish the proud religious zealot Saul, in order to create the humble servant that we know, Apostle Paul. And today we travel to the Old Testament to meet, that's right, Amos, <laughs> a common shepherd and a fig farmer whom God has prepared to deliver a prophetic message to a defiant decadent culture in northern Israel and beyond. Uh, this is an awesome story. It's an awesome story. You know what? It's by prayer that through this study of this Old Testament prophet, Amos, you will understand how and why God calls the common, you and I, an ordinary, you and I, to accomplish extraordinary things for his kingdom and for his glory. Amen. And how and why he is calling you today to a life 
not only uncommon, but glorious in his sight, a fruit bearing Christian life. I hope this excites you. I hope this journey we're on is going to empower you and motivate you to give over your life to Jesus to say, here am I, send me. How about that? We have a website. It's called www.reverenddarren.com. You'll find all of the teaching room materials on there, the print studies, links to videos, and some music. This website is for the body of Christ. And uh, also, if you enjoy this uh, YouTube channel, uh, be sure to subscribe by clicking on subscribe and, and tell others about this ministry. We love you. We appreciate you. And uh, we're going to dig in this week. Open your Bibles to the book of Amos. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, the vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Isaiah was king of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Joash, was king of Israel. The King James renders it like this. The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Quake. Let's dig in a little bit here. So Amos was called of God. That's the first thing we need to know. So these words that Amos is going to speak are God's prophetic words through Amos. When the Holy Spirit is speaking through us to an unbeliever or encouraging another believer through us, um, it is a powerful thing, and it makes you want to avail yourself that much more to God. Matthew 10, 16 to 20 says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. This is encouraging, for it is not ye that speak. But the spirit of your father which speaketh in you and so it will be with our friend amos i want you to remember the common nature of our prophet here he was a hard-working but poor herdsman from tekoa which was a rugged area of pasture 12 miles south of jerusalem Amos was a herder who also cared for an orchard of sycamore trees. Now the fruit, fruit that hung off these trees would be given to the poor. This was a fruit of the poor. Now Amos, like David, led a, a very humble, a faithful, God-centered life, hardworking, um, in the fields, and... I wrote down this, you know, just as Amos cultivated these sycamore trees, God had cultivated in him a heart for justice. One of our main themes here. He had cultivated in him a heart for justice on behalf of the poor and an intolerance for injustice against the poor by the rich. Concerning Israel. Well, the day came when Amos would speak, called by God to stand up and preach against the social and economic sins of the northern kingdom, Israel. This is assignment number one for our friend Amos. He packed his bags. He traveled to the opulent worship centers of Israel, where the rich relaxed in all their splendor. 
Think Bill Gates, think Jeff Bezos, think the opulent rich of Hollywood, people with so much money they don't even know what to do with it all. Hundreds, millions of dollars. Yeah, kind of makes you either long for it or just sick to your stomach. <laughs> I don't know what to think. But they were rich. They had become rich and decadent and Amos was sent in there to speak against their injustices against the poor. So his message, his words, would be supernaturally charged with sharp rebuke against their values, which had been distorted by decadence, riches, right? So God would soon bring sober clarity with a message packed with divine justice. I can't wait to get into it. So it's important to point out that the injustice rampant in the uh, northern Israel, listen, <laughs> things like this, this hard-heartedness, um, this opulence, this luxury, uh, this life of riches did not develop overnight. In my uh, teacher's commentary, it reads this, the fitful warfare, the fitful warfare with Syria which had flared up time and time again since the days of Elijah and Elisha was over. The 100 year feud was settled and the military threat ended when Damascus came under the sovereignty of Jeroboam II. Israel's territory almost reached the borders of the United Kingdom of Dave's, David's day. An economic explosion accompanied the military success as spectacular as the stunning revival of West Germany and Japan after World War II. <laughs> wow. So Israel now controlled ancient trade routes and expansion gave rise to a new social class of wealthy merchants. Well, there you go. Wealth created a demand for the many luxuries available from all over the known world. Pressured by the influx of wealth, jolting social changes took place. Obviously, the population began to shift from farms to cities and towns. Class distinctions crystallized with the rich bent on piling up profits at the expense of their poorer brothers. Interesting. A lot of parallels to the book of James here as well. Exorbitant prices were charged, poor farmers were dispossessed so that the rich might build up great estates. A heartless unconcern for the sufferings of the oppressed marked the well-to-do. That from my teacher's commentary. That's how it goes. Money, or I should say, the love of money corrupts. So as a matter of timeline here, um, Isaiah reigned in Judah from 792 to 740, and Jeroboam II reigned in Israel from 793 to 753. So you're probably wondering, what about this, this earthquake? Well, that also is a time reference for us. It's very significant, even as the earthquake itself must have been significant as a like an epic natural disaster that everyone would remember. Perhaps a judgment of God even. So it serves here as a time reference. It's also mentioned in uh, Zechariah 14.5 if you want to check there as well. This was a major significant natural disaster, this, this earthquake. In Amos 1.2, it says, He said, The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers. We're getting into it now, aren't we? The judgment. A lot of people think God is this way. He's, you know, fire and brimstone. Uh, judgment. Well, I would say it's difficult in our current culture um, of worldly relativism 
and churchy hyper grace to even, ima even imagine a God of divine judgment. It's just hard for us to imagine that. But to understand the context here, um, we simply need to understand the perspective of Amos, right? Farmer, herder, prophet, Amos, who has but one message for the rich living at the expense of the poor. And this is God's heart, okay? But he's about to say, and this is my paraphrase, listen people, God is about to exact justice on you people living in opulence at the expense of the precious poor. So it's true that Jesus is our good shepherd. We are his beloved sheep, John 10, 11. God leads, he protects us, we're his flock. Um, but in Amos 1, 2, God's depicted as a ferocious lion. A ferocious lion. He will devour those who are evil, who are unfaithful to his word. So Amos also had in Hosea, prophet Hosea, a like-minded fellow prophet who prophesied the same exact thing. Look at this from Hosea 11.10. It says, they shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. There's that lion reference again. When he shall roar, then the children, the children shall tremble from the west. <laughs> okay, let's not put God in a box. Let's refer to the whole counsel of God to understand the fullness of God. We can't understand it all, but why did he give us his word? To know him and enjoy him forever to have relationship with him, to know him, to know God. So we know from biblical precedent, God causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. Listen, he enables fields to be fertile. In this verse, Amos warns that God will dry up the land completely completely to the point that even the most fertile fields like Carmel which was known to be very fertile even it would wither it would just wither away from the dryness and the lack of rain so we've learned so far that Amos has been called to call out the rich sector of the northern kingdom. But he's going to do it with great detail. Why? Because our God convicts with specifics. Let me remind you right now that, that um, the evil one condemns, God convicts. And when the evil one condemns, he does it in a very vague blanket condemnation. Romans 8, 1 says there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. None. None. So as we're going to hear in next week's passage, if we will listen, if we will listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, not harden our hearts. Talks about that in Hebrews 3, 7 to 19. Do not harden your hearts when God is convicting. Don't do it. You know what? God will be gracious, but he'll never be general when he's dealing with our sin. Let me say, say that again. God will be gracious, but he will never be general when he deals with our sin. He'll make sure that we know what he's uh, zeroing in on so that we can uh, very quickly repent, ask for his forgiveness, 
and he will forgive us and wash us clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. I look forward to meeting you here in the teaching room next week. I'm Reverend Darren. Have an awesome week in the Lord. God bless.